Well, greetings, Grow family. It's good to be together this evening. Glad you guys are here tonight. Welcome to those of you online joining us as well as in the courtyard. And welcome to you here in the worship center. It's always good to be together on these worship services, isn't it? Special, special times. I believe God has something special for us tonight. If you are new with us here at the Grove, I do want to point your attention to our bulletin. If you're with us online, there's a link there. Uh, it's a connect card. And I would ask that you would fill that out and bring it over here to Guest Central after service where you can meet some of our staff. And I want to let you know about something really special this week. Uh, if you've been around here a couple of weeks, uh, you know that January 17th is a special day. We are inaugurating uh, the Changed Experience, which is going to happen right here in the Worship Center. It's a curriculum that many of our staff have teamed up to write, and it's going to be launched through the small group, table group setting. Meaning, if you are in a men and women's Bible study table, men or women's Bible study table, or if you're in a home group, you are already going through this. But we are going to meet right here in this room on the 17th, Wednesday, to inaugurate it, to launch it, to kick it off. So we're all coming together at 6.30 p.m. right here, and we are looking forward to doing that with you. Now, if you're not in a group, we want to invite you to sign up for one. You can do that either online or in the ministry hallway after service, uh, which is between these two entrances on the other side of the wall. Uh, you can sign up there. We will have children uh, services programs throughout uh, the next two weeks. So 17th, there will be child uh, services programs as well as the 24th. The 24th is when we start meeting in groups. So there will be no morning study on this 17th. There will be morning study on the 24th where, where we are in groups for men and women as well as in here for the women, men and C100 and home groups meet at the home starting that week. That's next week. All right. Well, there's a few more announcements in your bulletin I want to draw your attention to. There's a literacy class you can volunteer for, as well as a grandparenting class coming up. Uh, more about that in here. Guys, I'm excited that we're together tonight. May God bless you. I want to ask that you would stand as we prepare for worship. Good evening, church. How are we doing tonight? Is there anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord just one more time to give praise and to give glory to an amazing God? Well, why don't you clap your hands like this? Come on, church. Hey, why don't you help me sing it tonight? So I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Oh, I raise a hallelujah. There you go. Louder than the unbelief. Oh, so I raise a hallelujah. Oh, I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Say.
Can we give him some praise tonight? He's deserving of our worship and he's deserving of our praise. So we give him a hallelujah. I don't know about you, church, but I came to rejoice tonight. Is there anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Well, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I need everybody to clap your hands like this. Come on. No matter what you're going through, God is so good.
tonight we've come to rejoice because God has given us something to rejoice about he's given us a breath in our body he's allowed for us to see another day and so father we thank you so much for just being the most consistent thing in our lives God we're so grateful and so honored that we get to call you father and get to worship so as the service continues God I pray that you would do the work that you've already begun in the lives of your people we love you we honor you it's in your precious son Jesus's name we pray that all God's people say amen say amen one more time <laughs> hey, church, my ask you to do me a favor. Can you guys take a seat as we get ready to honor Dr. King with this video? Tomorrow is a day to remember that the time is always right to do what is right. To remember that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. To remember that forgiveness is not an occasional act, but a permanent attitude. To remember that faith is taking the first step, 
even when you don't see the whole staircase. To remember that our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about the things that matter. To remember that darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. And that hate cannot drive out hate, no, only love can do that. To remember to never succumb to the temptation of bitterness. To remember that out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. To remember that we still have a dream. Amen, 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 amen. This weekend we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, life, his birthday, uh, which is tomorrow, and really the, the worthy life that he lived. Uh, Dr. King was a follower of Jesus who wanted all people, every race, to love each other, and it was an idea that clashed with, clashed with culture. Uh, we celebrate the outcome of his life today, but we also have to keep in mind that people were not celebrating uh, what he was doing while he was alive. I uh, read an article that the last Gallup poll to ask about Dr. Martin Luther King's life while he was alive in 1966 found his unfavorable rating was 63%. The majority of people did not like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and what he stood for. In the mid-70s, almost 10 years after uh, his death, his rating started to go up. Um, it went up to 67% of Americans believed the protest marches he had led helped speed up the civil rights legislation. So time went by for people to realize, like, oh, okay, actually what, what he did was a good thing, uh, that that was good. Uh, the, the holiday that we celebrate, it didn't become a national holiday until 1983, uh, 41 years ago uh, in the Reagan administration. 50% uh, of the country did not want that to happen, they didn't want it to be a national holiday. Today, uh, if you take a poll of Dr. Martin Luther King, 95% of people see him as a national hero uh, today. Uh, I, I think that's something for us to consider and think through because even this year we're talking about living a worthy life. And in, in living a worthy life and wanting to take worthy steps in honoring God, we're going to clash with culture. And many times we will not see the worthy outcome until later on, or many people will not acknowledge it as a worthy outcome until later on. I, Praise God for Dr. Martin Luther King and his life and what he did to stand up for what is true. Uh, let's take a moment. Let's pray and thank God that uh, we have a God that loves all people. Praise God that we're at a church that wants to share the gospel with all people and that that is so important to who we are. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you and we praise you. We know that you love every single person in this world. And you want all people to come to a knowledge of the truth that your son Jesus Christ is Lord. God, give us a heart like yours. Take away any biases that we have towards people that are different than us. God, I pray that you would teach us to love people simply like you love people. So show us how we can serve one another in humility. Show us how we can put people first, even if we think differently than them. Um, teach us to love like you. As we study your word today, may we see your love for all people, because it's all over the text. And may we love others the same. We pray this in your name. Amen. I want to thank all of you for coming to Saturday afternoon, Saturday night service. I mean, it is growing a little bit. You can look around. Uh, 1045 last week, and there was no room. People walked in, and they walked out. There were chairs in the ministry hallway, uh, people watching because it was cold outside. So I just want to say thank you for coming to this service. Uh, and if, you, if, you, if this is like your service or you're thinking about it, keep coming to Saturday. Come to Saturday. You're going to hear it for the first time before I change things for tomorrow, okay? Uh, but appreciate you being here. Point number one, we're going to dive right in. Walking worthy comes with worthy outcomes. Walking worthy, as you think about it, should I walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Should I take that next step and do what he's called me to do? Will, will it work out? Will there be fruit? Yes, there will. There'll be a worthy outcome. There will be. It just may take some time. It's not going to be easy. It may be hard, but it's going to be worth it. I think a lot of times we ask that question, is this worth it? Is it worth it? I think we as human beings, we do that with everything that we do. 
You know, at this time of year, I always diet. I lose 20 pounds in the next six months, I gain 20 pounds the second six months. It happens every single year. I'm on Weight Watchers now, me and all the middle-aged women, <laughs> middle-aged women at our church. <laughs> Any guys on Weight Watchers in here? No, just me. Just me. <laughs> uh, so we'll try it out. Is it going to be worth it? I hope it's going to be worth it. Think about taking a kid, the kids and, and uh, Natalie and I on a cruise in the summer. Is it worth it to take kids on a cruise? Yes. Yes. We'll make it worth it if we do. I'll eat so much from that buffet. <laughs> I'm like, I am every bite, I'm earning my money back. It will be worth it. Is it worth it to go to the Angels game this year? <laughs> I don't think it's going to be worth it. <laughs> I'll follow them, but I don't know if it's going to be worth it. I think we will constantly ask ourselves those types of questions in regards to following the Lord. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to keep going? Is there going to be a worthy outcome of what's going to come from this later on? There will be. I guarantee it. That by the end of your life, if you've taken those worthy steps, one step after another, worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you'll look back, no matter how hard it was, and say, you know what? Totally worth it. You will not think that your life was wasted, that you wasted time following Jesus. It will be worth it when you put him first in your life. Last weekend, we began to learn about Paul and Timothy's relationship with the church of Philippi, the church that they loved, the church that they served. We looked at Philippians 1, 1 through 2, specifically verse 1. Today, we're going to look specifically at verse 2, uh, and we'll also go back to Acts 16 again. In verse 1 and 2, this is the greeting of the letter. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are at, Fa- at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul and Timothy, they're introducing themselves. Paul doesn't introduce himself as an apostle because he doesn't need to share his authority with this church. He knows how much he loves uh, them. He says, I'm a servant. I'm a slave of Christ. I'm not the one in charge. God's the one that's in charge. He's writing this letter to all the saints in this church, to all the believers, those who have been set apart and made holy through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, believing in him. Then he goes on to say in verse 2 again, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. I think the order is important because when God gives us grace and we come to believe in him as Lord and Savior, that comes first. And peace comes after that. We have peace with God. We have peace knowing that he's in charge of all things. Man, the grace of God being poured out to us and the peace that follows. As we look at verse 3, I'm not supposed to hit verse 3. Damon's going to preach next week and hit on that. But I'm going to steal this one verse. You never steal a pastor's verse. You don't do that. It's like a no-no in the pastor world. Okay, But we're just going to do this one little verse. Okay? He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. See, Damon can't be mad about that. But I, I like this because Paul's greeting them. He just said, grace and peace to you, God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, I thank God in my remembrance of you. I'm thinking back 10 years ago and the grace that God gave, gave you, the peace that God gave you. I can't stop but thank God as I remember what God did in your life. He's remembering the grace that God gave them. Uh, we looked at Acts 16 last week where Paul met Timothy. He brought Timothy along and asked him to join kind of his church planning team with Silas and with Luke. Uh, they had worthy plans to To start a church, they wanted to go to Asia, but the Lord forbade them to go to Asia. And then they wanted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus kept them from going to Bithynia. And then they receive a vision of the Macedonia man, and Macedonia once again is the region that Philippi is in. And when they see this vision of this man saying, come and help us, help us over here, they, they immediately obey and they go, knowing that God had prepared people to hear the gospel It's something that's good in our minds because I think a lot of us were nervous to share the gospel with people. God is preparing people's hearts to hear the gospel and receive it. 
It's just a matter of us being obedient to share. The people at your work, the people that he directs your steps to, there are people waiting to hear the gospel. I, said, I mentioned this before, but before my dad was a believer, he, when he was in high school, he was waiting for his friends to share with him about Jesus. Just like, somebody share with me. I'm waiting for this to happen. I think it's interesting, it's good for us to know this, that Paul, Silas, uh, Timothy, Luke, the location of where they were going was not important. The destination was not important, but the gospel is what drove them. The gospel was driving them. Think about that in your life. Does the gospel drive you in where you're going in life and what you do and how you act and how you live every single day? Today, I'm going to introduce you to the first three converts of the church of Philippi. We get to see how this church was formed and to see the people who are recipients of God's grace and the peace that they received, the people that Paul is remembering and thanking God for. Uh, we're going to notice as we study these, these, these stories, these conversions, uh, that they're all unique. They're all very different people. Um, but I think it's important for us to learn about them if we're going to appreciate the letter that was written to them by Paul. So let's look at Acts 16, 13 through 15. This is about Lydia, and I've talked about Lydia a little bit in a couple sermons, but I have to give her more time right now as well as uh, we look at these three converts that really helped start the church of Philippi. Acts 16, 13 through 15, they're already in Philippi, and it says, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. Once again, no synagogue, no godly men there. There's just some women. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. Now, that would have been that city in Asia. So she's Asian. So even though God forbid them to go to Asia, I think it's interesting here that this woman is from Asia. A seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. I love this verse. I didn't even underline it in your Bible if you have your Bibles open. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. I mean, God's the one who made this happen. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And, and she prevailed upon us. I want to point out a couple things about this picture that we're given of Lydia, because we are given a picture of her. She's a seller of purple goods. Uh, that, that color was very trendy. It was the best color. It's the color of royalty. So even when you think about Lydia in your mind, she's a businesswoman. She's a high-class businesswoman, and she has style. She's a fashionista. Uh, she has a house. She owns a house. The church ends up meeting in this house, which means that she's a bit of a baller. If you look at her during this point in time, you think about what kind of woman would this have been? It's a woman who would just very savvy businesswoman who would have lived in a metropolitan area. She would have lived in Beverly Hills. She would have uh, lived in Paris or Manhattan. I mean, this lady is on top of her game. She is in control of her life. We're also told that she fears God. That's interesting. She fears the Lord. She doesn't know who Jesus is, but she fears God. Somehow in her life, she heard about the God of the Old Testament, and she fears him, and she is seeking him. She's coming together with her lady friends, and they're, she's praying to God. Oh, God, I want you. Oh, God, I, I need you. She's a seeker of God, but she does not know Jesus. I think it's important for you to know, if you seek God, you'll find him. Amen. God will bring people to you. People have asked me that question. What about the people in the middle of nowhere who have never heard about Jesus? If they die, are they going to go to hell? Yeah, they will. No one gets a free pass to heaven. We have, that's why, that's why we're so, so important to send people overseas. Well, they don't even have a chance. They have a chance. If someone steps outside, as Romans 1 says, you can acknowledge that there's God. If you're seeking God, God sends people. He's preparing people. He's sending people. This woman's seeking God, and he sends this team to her so that she could hear the full version of the truth. It's like she knew that there was a treasure. God, you are my treasure. She just didn't have a key to the box yet. And Jesus was that key. It says that they came and they sat down and they spoke to her. What did they speak to her? The gospel. I want to tell you about who God is. 
I want to tell you about Jesus, his son who came to this earth and died on the cross for our sins. And you can just imagine as Lydia is hearing this, God opens up her heart to pay attention to what's being said. And this lady's smart. She's very, very smart. She's like, that's it. And she believes right away. And she not only believes right away, she gets baptized right away. We're going to see that a couple of times. When you believe, you give your life to Jesus, you get baptized. Boom, right away. It's not like, I don't know if I'm ready to get baptized. What do you mean you're not ready to get baptized? You just stood up and accepted Christ. Believe and get baptized. Repent and get baptized. we got a baptism next week. Trevor's right here. You want to get baptized? Get baptized next week. Follow Jesus. You don't have to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. But if, you want, if you're ready to stand before Jesus and say, I believe, you're ready to get baptized and let other people know that you're following after him. Point number two in your notes, the businesswoman. We're going to go through these converts. She's the businesswoman, and grace is given to a God-fearing woman seeking the truth. So she was seeking the truth. We could even say that she was, quote-unquote, religious, but that didn't earn her her salvation. Once again, I really, really like verse 14. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said. God made it possible. God poured out his grace upon her and allowed her her to believe, her and her household. Now, as we think about the church of Philippi and the type of people that they, they, were, they were made up with, I don't even get the idea like, wow, must have been a very trendy church. Everyone's wearing purple there, you know. We got business women, business men, all these high class society people. That's not true. That's just Lydia's story. As we go to the next person that is converted, you'll see that her story is a lot different than Lydia's story. Just like every single person in this church, all of our stories are different. All of our backgrounds are different. The grace of God has come and met each one of us at a different point in our life, but God's grace saved each and every single one of us. Let's look at Acts 16, 16 through 18. A very heartbreaking story. It says, as we were going to the place of prayer, so they're now going back to pray with Lydia and these ladies, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. I like this next part. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. I think it's a very fascinating story. Fascinating story because after they share the gospel with Lydia and her friends, they, it's another day. You ever have, it's just another day. And what are we seeing with, with, with this little church planning team? They're focused on discipleship. They went to pray that was a part of their daily routine. We're going to go and we're going to pray. We're going to, seek, we're going to seek after the Lord. And God brings to them the next person that he wants them to, to help, to save, to say the name of Jesus. And it's not another high-class businesswoman who seems to be in control of her life, but this time it's a, a slave girl who has no control of her life. This time it's a girl who is, is really, she's under demonic control. It's a completely different story. And we, we see in this passage that through, uh, through this demon that she has inside of her, she has the ability to tell the future. And for this reason, she's used by her owners to make money. They're taking advantage of her. Uh, so she's going around and she's yelling because she can, she can see what's going on. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now, Paul's not amused by her. He's not like, yes, truth. Everyone listen to her and what she is saying. No, we're told the great apostle Paul, the great apostle Paul was greatly annoyed. Greatly annoyed. I don't know about you. That encourages my heart. Why? Because I get greatly annoyed. Don't you get greatly annoyed? Sometimes it just happens. Sometimes it's like, I'm just annoyed. It, it, this, this encourages me. Some people are just annoying. Sometimes people are just annoying. It wasn't her fault, though, was it? Many times our annoyance is our, our own fault. It's our own issues. Aren't we so thankful that God's not annoyed with us? Oh, I have to think, like, sometimes, like, how are you not annoyed with me? 
I say that to Natalie too. <laughs> you know, how are you? Maybe she is sometimes. <laughs> oh man. Uh, but Paul, Paul, Paul was annoyed. At the same time, going back to this girl, I mean, she was oppressed. That's the thing that's so sad. She had a demon inside of her. She was oppressed by a demon. She was oppressed by, by her owners. Um, she must have been confusing people by what she said. I mean, this, this was a polytheistic culture. So she's talking about, you know, a way to salvation. They're probably like, okay, I mean, whatever. There's, we all believe all different types of things here. We're told that she's doing this for many days. You know how some, like, even your kids just do something over and over again for days upon days. Like everybody has their limits. Like sooner or later, they're going to snap once in a while. You ever pray that? Like, Lord, help me not to snap today. Like, I just feel like I'm just like one comment away from snapping. Like, help me not to snap today. <laughs> you know, <laughs> please, please, I don't want to do that. But then look at what God did. Look, and clearly, look at what God did. He didn't make Paul all happy and kind and be like, hey, sweet girl, why don't you come down by the river and I'm going to do a, a sweet conference for you on how to know the gospel. I want you to know about this. No, he doesn't, doesn't do that. But in his annoyance. Paul couldn't take her yapping anymore. He became so annoyed, he turned around and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, you come out of her. And we're told that the demon actually came out. God healed her and rescued her, even though Paul was annoyed. When I read that and I studied that, it just reminds me how powerful the name of Jesus is. The name of Jesus is powerful. The name of Jesus can heal people. In the name of Jesus, when you call upon the name of Jesus, it saves you. It's a reason why, there's a reason why the third commandment out of the Ten Commandments is don't take the Lord's name in vain. Don't do that. Now, it irritates me at times when people cuss. It really irritates me when people take God's name in vain. Don't let your spouse do that. Don't let your kids do that. Say, hey, don't do that. Do you understand how powerful that name is? It's a sacred, holy name. That even when someone uses it in their annoyance, it heals and rescues a girl who is oppressed. Now, like I said, I, I do think this. Uh, sometimes God does put annoying people in our lives so we can lead them to Jesus. And I'll say it again. Many times it's not their problem. It's our problem. Many times, you know, people are the way they are for a reason. I have to think about that sometimes. People are the way they are for a a reason. I remember this girl that was in our youth group and she, she gave me a hard time. I didn't even plan on saying this, but it's just happening right now. Um, I, I kicked her out of our youth group. She bugged me. She bugged me. And over time, I actually heard her story. And when I heard her story, my heart broke. I'm like, my goodness, how shallow am I? that I was letting my own emotions get in the way with the background that you had. And now, then all of a sudden, like Natalie and I, we started caring for this person. That she ended up coming to our small group. It's like, when you understand the full story, your heart changes, does it not? So the person that's annoying you, maybe say like, Lord, why are they annoying me? Lord, why did you bring them into my life? What am I supposed to do in bringing them closer to you? And you may not respond perfectly. Nobody ever does. But praise God that his grace is bigger than we can handle difficult people in our life. Amen? I'll say amen to that. Point number three on your notes, the slave. Grace is given to an oppressed girl. So now we're seeing a different aspect of grace being given to someone who wasn't in control of her life. The name of Jesus spoken over her changes her life. Unfortunately, there are some people who are not happy about this change. Her owners... Her owners are not happy because now the demon's gone. She's not telling the future. And as, as the demon is gone, so is their wealth gone. It is leaving them. So let's go on to read Acts 16, 19 through 24. Acts 16, 19 through 24 says, But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept our practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison 
and fastened their feet in the stocks. So these owners are not happy with Paul and Silas. They start spreading like nonsense about what they're doing, that they're disturbing the city, advocating customs that are not lawful for us Romans. They don't know this, but Paul and Silas, they're Romans. They just haven't spoken up yet, which is interesting. The crowds get upset and they start attacking them. Can't imagine. Just read over that. Put yourself in their shoes. All of a sudden people are attacking you. The magistrates, who would have been the city officials, specifically, when I read the commentaries, they say there would have been two, two guys. They even join in. They're supposed to tell everyone to settle down and have a trial. They rip off Paul and Silas's clothes in order for them to be beaten with rods and then order them to be put in prison with their feet in the stocks. Now, don't think like medieval times kind of uh, security where it's like long chains and you're kind of walking around. But what they said during this time, it's wooden stocks connected to the wall. More than likely, they were even standing where they could not move at all. Many times it was a little higher up and they would cause them to stretch out. Really, it was, it was torture. Uh, it would create a lot of cramps and pain. It was not good. So put yourself in Paul and Silas's shoes. You're sitting there in prison. You just got beaten with a rod. No clothes on. You can't move. You're in a lot of pain. You're asking yourself this, is it worth it? <laughs> is it worth it? The heck is going on here? I'm in my mind, if I'm being completely honest, I'm, I'm having a conversation with the Lord and I'm like, man, I didn't even want to come here. I wanted to go to Asia. You forbade me to go to Asia. I wanted to go to Bithynia. It was your spirit that kept me from going to Bithynia. You brought me to this place. I know I was a little annoyed, but I didn't take your name in vain. The spirit was out of her, and now you're allowing me to get beaten with rods, and I'm in pain, I'm sitting here with no clothes on? I'd be like, Lord, is this worth it right now? You ever asked yourself that? Is it worth it? Is it worth it what I'm going through and following after you? Man, I would have been confused. I would have been upset. All of these things. Have you ever attempted to do something for God and it gets harder? Thanks, thanks for responding. <laughs> hey, me too. It's one of those things that is interesting. Like you attempt to do something for God and then it gets, it gets harder. I'm like, why is it getting harder? Like I'm trying to walk worthy. I'm trying, I'm trying to do this for you. Why is this getting harder, Lord? And for, to be fair, I mean, a lot of times it's harder. And then there's an aspect where it's easier. It's kind of like a both and. It's like, this is hard. Okay, and it's kind of easy. <laughs> you know, it just kind of depends on the day. Kind of depends on the moment. It's, it's harder because when we fight to do something for God and walk worthy of the gospel, we're fighting against the enemy. So there's going to be an aspect where it's harder. The enemy of God is not other human beings. We have to keep that in our mind. It doesn't matter how bad other humans are. They're not the enemy Ephesians 6, 12 says, For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And these dark powers that are real are trying to stop the spread of the gospel, and they're trying to stop you from walking worthy and taking that next step so that other people will be converted, so that other people will be saved. And that's hard. It's a fight. If you feel like you're wrestling at times in your soul, it's because you are and because it's a fight. It even says in 6.12, it says for our fight. Like there's going to be a fight. There's going to be a wrestle. There's going to be a turmoil in your heart, maybe every single day of your life where it's like, oh, this is hard. Oh, to walk worthy, it's hard. I feel like there's something against me in this. And there is something against you in this. That's why it's, that's why it's hard. It is hard. We'll suffer at times. We'll suffer in doing the things that God has called us to do. And at the same time, it's easier because God's with us. He's fighting on our behalf. And there'll be times where you see God show up, you're like, oh, I so badly needed you to show up right then. And you did. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. Oh, it was worth it. Oh, it was worth it. You were there. And we see this Exodus 14, 14, it says the Lord will fight for you. You only have to be still. The Lord will come and fight for you. You only have to be still. If Paul heard this, he's like, I hear you, Lord. You know, I'm in the stocks and I'm still. Like, I need you to fight for me right now. 
Deuteronomy 24 says, For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you the victory. Romans 8.31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So you have opposition that's fighting against you. You have God who's fighting for you. And God wins. And God does not waste anything in your life. There's no suffering. If you're walking worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ and you feel opposition, a class, a clash of culture, something that's going on because you took that step for the Lord, the Lord will not waste it. There will be a worthy outcome. There will. Keep telling yourself over and over again. Paul and Silas were beaten up and put in prison, but God wastes nothing. Because look at the next story. Acts 16. 25 through 30, 25 through 34. It says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They're not mad. They're not upset. They're not like, what's going on? They're praising God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Like, what are these guys doing? And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. They're like, let's get out of here. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword, was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are here. We're all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Praise the Lord. You know, Paul and Silas, they knew their suffering was worth it. I want faith like theirs. They're praising God. They've been beaten. They're praying. They're praising. People are listening. One of the greatest ways for people to, really, their hearts to be converted, to come to know the Lord, is when you're praising God in the hardest times of your life. People will listen to you. They'll see you. They'll see that something different is in you. What a testimony when we praise God in the midst of suffering. Lord, when more suffering comes my way, may I praise you. Those are things I pray when I read these passages. While in prison, all of a sudden an earthquake happens. Amazing. And all the doors just miraculously open up. Can you imagine that moment? And all the shackles that are on their feet, they just come undone. The bonds miraculously come undone. And we're told that the jailer had fallen asleep. And when he had realized what had happened, he drew his sword to kill himself. And the reason why is because if those prisoners would have escaped back in, that, in those days, he would have been executed for that because he wasn't paying attention. This was an honor-shame culture. He knew he'd be executed. He's like, I'm not going to let them execute me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die in honor was his thought process of what he was going to do. I mean, get this for the jailer. This is the worst case scenario in his life. You could even say this. This was the worst day of his life. Those prisoners escaped, he's going to die. And right before he's about to do harm to himself, Paul says, stop. Stop, don't do it. Do not do it. I think that's amazing. Paul says, we're all here. We're not going anywhere. Now, let me ask you again, because I'm trying to put myself in this position too. If you're in the prison... And all those things happen. Are you staying? Are you staying? Now keep this in your mind with this prison guard. He's a bully. More than likely, he was one of the guys that was beating you with a rod. He throws you in there. He does not care about you at all. And then this big miracle happens and all the doors are opening and unfastened. It's like, should I run for it? And out of the corner of your eye, you see him take out his sword. Are you running over to stop him and saying, don't do that? Or are you running away saying, you know what? That's what you deserve. You got yourself in it. What, where is your mindset at? Only you know. But to think about Paul and Silas, the kindness that they showed, the grace that they showed, 
They tell the man, stop. Stop, don't do that to yourself. We're all here. We're all here and we're, we're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. This whole story is fascinating to me. I also think it's fascinating because it's another unique story. You have Lydia who's high class. High class, she has a lot of money. You have the slave girl, low class, no money. You have the jailer, and he's blue collar, middle class. Uh, More than likely, commentators say he was a Roman soldier. Now he's older, it's a retirement job. He's sitting there making sure these goons don't get out of prison. Kind of an easy job. He doesn't want to listen to their praising God. He doesn't want to hear them talking about Jesus. And that's kind of the thing that's interesting. Some people, you know those kind of people where there's just kind of a harder personality. It's like, if I say anything to them about Jesus, they're not going to listen to me. They're not going to listen. I think it's interesting for Paul. Paul told Lydia about Jesus. She was seeking Paul told the slave girl about Jesus. She kind of opened the door for for that to happen. Paul and Silas, they did not initiate. They did not initiate a conversation with this man about Jesus. This man would have to initiate it himself. And really, it was the actions of these these men, these honorable men. I mean, this is a guy of honor. He's a soldier. And the fact that these guys could have ran and gone out there and saved their life And yet they stayed so that really, in them staying, they saved his life. Well, in that soldier's mind right there, that's honor. You would do this to honor me? And at this point, Paul is not the one who comes to him. But this blue-collar, tough bully who doesn't even care comes running towards Paul and Silas. and says, I need to know, what must I do to be saved? Tell me, what must I do to be saved? And it's just such a simple statement. They say to him, believe in the Lord Jesus. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And he does. He believes. And you can see the transformation. It's immediate. Where it's like, my goodness, he takes them to his house. And he's like, probably he's like, tell them, but tell them all. They all need to know. This is the manly, manly man, blue collar man. He's like, you listen to what they say. Listen to it. You're believing. All of us are believing, you know. And after they believe, they all get baptized right away. I just picture this tough, mean man who, who beat them with rods, now getting on his knees and wiping down the wounds that he caused on them. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. What was I thinking? And then he's, he's cooking a meal and, and they're eating together. As there's probably just tons of tons of questions and they rejoice together. They rejoice together that he and his whole household believed in God. Point number four in your notes, the blue collar jailer. Grace is given to a bully on the worst day of his life. The worst day of his life. On the worst day of his life, it became the best day of his life. And I would say this, praise God, he didn't harm himself. For those of you who are even considering doing harm to yourself, I would beg you, do not do that. Do not do it. And I'm sure there's pain. I'm sure there's hurt. I'm sure you may be scared of something. But taking that next worthy step and saying, Lord, I need you right now. The worst situation of your life could be becoming the best situation of your life. And who knows what the Lord will do in your life that may even lead to the salvation of more people in your family. Because if he does something to himself, his family is not saved. But, man, someone stopped him from doing that. Praise God, Paul and Silas were focused on the jailer's eternal salvation more than saving their own life. I mean, to think about putting other people first. Think about the people that do you wrong. And I, and I have this in me. You do me wrong, my first thought, I'm like a fight or flight, I'm a fighter. I've never been in a fight, but my first thought is aggression. I don't want that. I want it to be grace. When someone does me wrong, like how can I show them kindness which maybe would even open the door for them to believe. Think about who those people are in your own life. And think through these things as we're studying these passages. When you walk worthy, there will be worthy outcomes in your life. It may come with suffering like Paul and Silas. It may come with trials. There will be clashes with culture. It's going to happen. There's a clash with culture in this city because the majority of the world opposes God. But it will be worth it. 
Like, it will be worth it when we walk worthy of the gospel because we'll see God do things that only God can do, that only he can do. We'll see God save people. The gospel drove Paul and Silas to walk worthy every single step. And they cared, this is, I think it's important, they cared more about conversions than their own comfort. They cared more about conversions than their own comfort. Look at what happens next in Acts 16, 35 through 40. It says, but when in, it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go, which means that the jailer actually brought them back to jail. And the jailer reported these words to Paul and Silas, hey guys, you're out of here. The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come now and go in peace. I love this part of the passage. But Paul said to them, actually, they've beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, uh uh-oh, and have thrown us into prison, and do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. Hey, we're sorry about that. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out to the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and they departed. This is something that's fascinating to me. They waited till all of this was done to say, oh, by the way, we're Roman citizens. It's funny how people care about their citizenship here in the United States more than the citizenship of people getting to heaven. I think about that with Paul and Silas. Not that we shouldn't care about our citizenship in the United States. We should. We should. There's a responsibility there. But with Paul and Silas, they allowed these things to happen knowing that God was guiding them every step of the way because they wanted to build more citizens in heaven. They cared more about conversions than they did about comfort. And oh, would that be true for us? Would that be true for me? Because I have to fight against that. Acts 16 is a picture of how God built his church. If you want to start reading Acts, Acts is fantastic. There's more conversions in Acts than any other book of the Bible. Because God is building his church, the Holy Spirit has come down. You're seeing people get saved over and over again. And when you think about the church and how unique it is, we're seeing it right here. Point number five on your notes. I took some of this wording from book from Matt Chandler, but I want to give him credit. It says, the church of Philippi, grace is given to unholy, in, incompatible strangers and makes them family. I mean, how different are all of these people? And every single author that I studied in regards to these passages right here, it comes back to the the unity and the diversity in the church and just how different it is. God is reaching all different types of people and making them one. The businesswoman, the slave girl, the jailer, they're all saved by the same gospel. There's an old Jewish prayer that apparently Jewish men would say, and people would even argue that, that Paul would have said this prayer, praising God. God, I praise you that I'm not a woman. God, I praise you that I'm not a slave. God, I praise you I'm not a Gentile. And wouldn't you know that when the gospel spreads to Europe and the first church is planted, God saves a woman, a slave, and a Gentile. He saves them all. He cares for all people. Timothy Keller, he put together this, uh, it, was, it was in a, uh, an article that I read, um, and I had our, our graphic designer put this together, but look at the differences here of the church. With Lydia, she's Asian, slave girl, most believe she's Greek, but she really could have been from anywhere, she's a slave, the jailer's Roman, so they're all different. Economically, you have wealthy, poor, and middle class. Spiritually, you have a god fear. you have a demonic, demonically hostile person, you have a morally indifferent, like, he doesn't care, just don't talk to me. Personality, Lydia's gentle, the other girl's mental, and the jailer's brutal. So all different types of people. Uh, Philosophically, most people believe Lydia was very intellectual, very smart. Uh, Slave girl had psychological needs. Jailer had moral needs. So it's just so diverse. I mean, look around. Look at all of our stories are so different. And we go back to verse 3 where Paul's saying, oh God, when I remember these people, I thank God. I thank you because of what you did, the grace and peace that comes from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, really, these three people could not have been more different, but the same gospel saved them all. 
This is what we have to remember. The gospel's for everyone. You can even tell someone to say this. I don't think I'm that religious. Okay, well, neither was the jailer. I just don't think I'm the type of person who's going to give my life to God. There is no type. God goes after all types. Praise the Lord, he goes after all types of people. And here's the thing. We only have to be still. God fights for us. In all of these situations, God is creating the opportunities for the right people to be saved. So here with all these three, Lydia, the businesswoman, the slave girl, and this blue-collar jailer, I'd like to introduce you to the Church of Philippi's church planning team that are going to meet together and form this church that Paul just so desperately loves. We're going to study this book together. As I close, get ready to close, I do want to say this. I know we have Lydia's in this room. Lydia is very smart business women and businessmen who have an idea of who God is, but they, they never had the key of understanding who Jesus Christ is as Lord and Savior. I'm sure there are people here who are oppressed and have been taken advantage of, and you're, you're hurting, and you just, you just don't know, like, oh, man, what, what am I supposed to do? How, I've gotten myself in a mess, maybe from the the heirs of other people, not the heirs, but just the wrongdoings. God can rescue you. God can save you. He can. And you're, you may be someone that's just so indifferent. You don't even want to hear this, but God has a way of opening your heart. He can open your heart and make you understand, how can I not say, if, if you want to give your life to Jesus? I mean, that softball-sized question that the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. Believe that God sent his son Jesus. Believe that, that Jesus is God and died on the cross for your sins. Believe that he rose again and, and repent of your sins and ask him to come into your life. I'll tell you what, believe today and get baptized next weekend. Let's do that. So even after service, if you want to come forward and you want to accept Christ, we'll be up here with you. We'd love for you to, to come up. If you need prayer for anything, please come forward. We'd love to pray for you. And also be thinking through in your mind, who are the Lydia's in your life that's surrounding you? Who are... Who are the, the, the oppressed people in your life? Who are the jailers, the blue-collared and different people? Who does God want you to share the gospel with? And who will be saved because we're faithful to bring the gospel to them? Lord, help us because we need you. Let's pray. Father, we need you. And I do. I beg you for myself and for every person here, help us to walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may the gospel be the thing that drives us. And even in the suffering, in the moments that are hard, may we praise you, may we worship you, may we have a, a testimony of like, you are so great, Lord, because you're always there. May you give us the boldness to share the gospel with people that are around us, not just to invite them to church, but to share the good news of who Jesus is, because many are ready to be saved. So Lord, help us to learn from Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke. Help us to be faithful with where you have us today. And may we bring you glory this week. We pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Thoughts.
Thank you for worshiping with us tonight. Uh, just a few announcements again before you leave. If you're new to the Grow family, we really would get to know you some more. You can go to your right at Guest Central. Uh, if you'd like some prayer, come on down to the front. We'll have prayer partners waiting just for you. And if you have a desire to give, there's giving baskets by the door. Please have a great remainder of your Saturday. God bless you all.